This episode is brought to you by the Arvada Center because they're kicking off their summer concert series in June. Relax under the stars at the Arvada Center's outdoor amphitheater and take in acts like Melissa Etheridge, Big Richard, Tower of Power, Preservation Hall Jazz Band, The Spin Doctors, and so much more. Concerts are scheduled for June through September. You can find a whole schedule of events and get your tickets today at arvadacenter.org. That's arvadacenter.org. Today on CityCast Denver. The 2024 legislative session is over. So what does that mean for Denver? We've got veteran state politics reporter Marianne Goodland on today to talk about the legislators' biggest wins, flops, and surprising acts of bipartisanship. Today is Monday, May 13th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Marianne Goodland, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. So we're looking back at the legislative session that just wrapped up this week. But before we get to that, I have to ask you about this tradition I just learned that you're at the center of. I've been seeing videos of you online playing the harp at the Capitol. Tell me, tell me more about that. Um, I have been playing on the last day of session uh, at the state Capitol, either on the floor of the House or the Senate or both. Uh, sometimes in the Capitol Rotunda. And I've been doing this for about 10 years now. I'm, I'm actually a professional harpist. Um, I play for weddings and festivals and all kinds of stuff. And I just did it for the heck of it one year. And everybody's like, you have to come back and do this again. So I do it every year. I love that your interests can collide for one day because those are very different those are very different parts of, I think, your personality, probably, too. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it, one one is my left brain side, which is what pays the bills. And I, I think I think that's right. And the right brain side, which feeds my soul. We'll put a link to it because it's just so much fun to watch. It's a little bit different than what we're used to seeing on the floor, house floor. But, um, you know, speaking of that, I guess being sort of being in that space, being at the Capitol, um, when we started this session, there were all these worries and calls for decorum. And then last week we saw legislators sort of dance, dancing together on the house floor and it seemed like everybody was getting along what do you what do you make of that situation this session? I, I actually did a story about this back in March called the A Tale of Two Legislatures, uh, sort of a you know a play on the Dickens, and, and and I said you know you have one legislature which wants to work together, wants to be bipartisan, reaching across the aisle, and then the other legislature which is sort of the normal. Uh, hyper-partisan stuff that goes on and really dominant tends to dominate the news coverage sometimes. Um, but what happened between last year and this year, last year we had so many new um, new lawmakers, particularly in the House, uh, something something like a third of the of of the house more than a third of the house turned over, and you had these people who didn't know each other, hadn't built those relationships, and lots of folks who said, um, you know, if you were a Democrat, well, I don't need Republican votes, I don't need to talk to them, and Republicans who were like, well, they don't care about my issues and they won't listen to me anyway. So, so you had you had a lot of that in the 2023 session. And it wound up at the last day of session with Republicans walking out in the House because they didn't want to vote on a bill that they felt like they had no time to look over. This was a property tax bill. And progressive Democrats who took the Speaker of the House off into a room and chewed her out for being uh, sort of more collegial with Republicans than they would have liked. So that was how things ended last year. Nobody got along. And it was toxic. We had two lawmakers, two Democrats who had just been elected to their first terms who quit by the end of the year, citing that toxic environment. And and I will tell you, I've been down there. This is my 26th session at the legislature. I've never seen anything like what happened last year. It was awful. So uh, they got to the special session after the defeat of Proposition HH in November. And all of a sudden, you started to see at least one initial sign that maybe this logjam of of vitriol was going to come to an end. And it was based on one bill, the bill setting up the property tax commission. 
even though the Republicans didn't like the rest of the bills, this one they worked very hard on to get really good representation from county commissioners, for example. And it was a bipartisan commission lawmakers from both sides of the aisle that were in it. And that and that commission took took the issue of property taxes and ran with it through the next couple of months. That kind of that was kind of where things started to change. People started talking to each other. They realized they had to. Democrats realized they didn't have a monopoly on good ideas and Republicans felt like they were being listened to. So and I started to see changes throughout this session where some major policy issues were starting to be bipartisan. And that was something we didn't see in 2023 at all. You know, the, uh, the major policy issues, particularly on housing and property taxes, were very one-sided. And you started to see that logjam breaking up and, and some really interesting bipartisan efforts going on. And that culminated in kind of the last 10 days of the session where you saw this uh, agreement on oil and gas um, between the oil and gas and environmental communities that the governor spearheaded, you saw a Tabor refund mechanism. That that was actually more shocking to me than the property tax bill because the governor has been calling for an income tax cut for every year the, the, um, in his state of the state address. Democrats wouldn't go anywhere near it. This year, they signed off on an income tax cut along with a change in the Tabor refund mechanism. That was very a very bipartisan bill, that, and that was that was a surprise. And then, of course, we had the property tax bill in the last three days. If you remember, last year they ran a property tax bill in the last three days, and all it did was cause chaos and and dissent. The property tax bill that we had that went through the legislature in the last three days was a completely different uh, situation. Can you explain a little bit more that, about that particular topic, the property taxes issue? Because I think. Uh, it's a big debate, but I would say like me as the average voter doesn't necessarily understand what's going on. Well, and the voters are really going to have the are going to uh, drive the train on this one because in November there's going to be one and maybe two ballot measures. They're going to ask voters to uh, first to put a cap on property tax increases. That's Initiative 50 that's already on the ballot. And then you have a second one, Initiative 108, which is going to uh reduce assessment rates for both homeowners and commercial buildings. Both of them are being run by Advanced Colorado Action backed by Colorado Concern. And this is this is something I'll get back to here in a minute. Um, the legislature had to do something on property taxes. They could not they could not adjourn without being able to say to the voters, we address this issue. This is this is what our solution is. Now, the interesting thing about Senate Bill 233, which is the bill that has this property, these property tax changes in it, it has a repeal in it. If either 50 or 108 or both pass in November, what the legislature did gets repealed, won't even be there. The legislature uh, has a slightly different approach to how they would reduce property taxes. And a lot of it has to do with a desire to protect K-12 education funding. There's a big concern that those two ballot measures in November are going to do a really big number on the state budget and the legislature would be required to backfill lost revenue to county governments. That's just the way the law works uh, to the tune of, and it could be as much as $3 billion, and there's no protection for K-12 funding. And that that could be a really huge hit to education, just as the General Assembly paid off a 15 year debt to K-12 in this this recent session. Is this situation surprising you at all with this, the taxes and the education component? Because these are things we talk about all the time. No, uh, no not not at all. Um the, there has been a real big push, and it's a bipartisan push, to protect K-12 funding. Uh, and this has been going on for a long time. This is this is nothing new. Um, the, the concern about protecting K-12 funding with the property tax issue, however, uh, I think is going to result in the biggest campaign you've ever seen from uh, and, and it'll be a bipartisan campaign, too, I think, uh, a big campaign against those ballot initiatives in November to protect and with the goal of saying you vote for this, you're you're going to wind up you know, with no funding for the schools. Mm. So really, ultimately, us as voters are going to be watching 
to see what what role we play. Voters should be paying attention to this because this has some real big impacts for uh, for how K-12 education is funded, but it also has impacts on fire districts, hospitals, library districts, uh, county governments. All of them are going to get a hit if these me- if these measures pass, according to the people I'm talking to. Um, another big story I wanted to talk to you about was last year, Governor Polis um, had this sort of big failure to get this massive land use reform bill through the legislature. Um, he was he wanted to compel cities to build more housing, basically to be more dense, to help us achieve our climate goals. And this session, he sort of broke that up into a more a piecemeal approach. Can you talk about how that turned out? Uh, the governor had uh, lots of significant wins on this issue of land use and zoning and affordable housing. The biggest one is House Bill 1313, which uh, sets up a requirement on transit-oriented communities. Now, these are um, communities in five met- what are called metropolitan planning organizations. They're almost all along the front range except for one out in Grand Junction. And it's a requirement, a density requirement, uh, for 40 units per acre along transit lines. And this can be bus routes or RTD or any other kind of, you know, transit system that might come along in the future. This, it, it started out with fairly major opposition from the local governments because it is a mandate. And there was, there was some big sticks in that bill. Uh, one, one carrot and lots of sticks. The, the sticks were, um, a, uh, uh, the ability of state government to file an injunction against a local government that refuses to go along with this. The other one, and I think that the one that was even more concerning, was that a local government would lose its state transportation funding. And that's significant for lots of communities. I'm hearing anywhere, you know, around 50 percent of the money they have for their roads and bridges and all that comes from the state. So that was a penalty. And the bill got through the House and on the on the day of its final vote, there were um, a handful of fairly influential re- Democrats who got Mark Snyder of Colorado Springs is a good example, who said, "I'm going to vote for this today, but if this bill comes back here with these penalties in it, I'll do everything in my power to kill it." So the very first thing that happened when the bill went over to the Senate was they took those things out, and that actually cost. Um, the sponsors, some backing from prominent Democrats over there, Senator Julie Gonzalez of Denver uh, being the most notable one. She just said she couldn't vote for this without those penalties. She felt that that was really important. So what we have is this requirement now, and it's it's a mandate on local governments, which they don't like, and they never they never did back this. They opposed this all the way to the very end because they don't like being told what to do. And part of this is actually constitutional. Most local governments, most cities are under what's known as home rule, where they get to make their own decisions on issues like zoning. And this is a mandate on zoning. So um, whether there's going to be any any pushback now that the bill is done, the governor hasn't signed it yet, but I expect that he'll have a big a big signing ceremony for it. But this was this was the biggest piece in the housing package. But there, like you said, there were lots of others. They broke up last year's bill into about six different pieces. You had another one on accessory dwelling units. These are what are referred to as granny flats. Sometimes they're tiny homes. They would be built on uh, the property of a single family home, uh, assuming that you and assuming you had the the space to do it, and you could get water rights and, and you know and that kind of thing or taps put in. And uh, this accessory dwelling units bill also passed with a whole lot less drama. It was actually a bipartisan bill. It was the only major housing bill that was bipartisan. And that passed, and um, it will require local governments to allow accessory dwelling units. Again, another thing that they're not crazy about is you know being told what to do. But but this this has now passed, and and I expect the governor will sign this one too. We also had lots of different things about uh, the amount, the number of people who could live in one unit. Uh, in Boulder, for example, I think it's limited to four. They passed a bill to allow a lot more unrelated people to live together, which will help with people who are struggling with rent, especially in some of our really high cost of living cities. Uh, we had another one on evictions. Um, this bill died last year. 
but it passed and has already been signed into law, making uh, requiring landlords to make sure that they have just cause when they want to evict somebody. This is so interesting. There's just so many different pieces to the housing conversation. And I see the governor trying to take the state approach, but the struggle is every city is reacting differently to how they're being sort of told what to do. But I want to step back just really quick to this ADU conversation, the accessory dwelling units conversation, because it's been a big conversation here in Denver in particular. And we already have this sort of neighborhood by neighborhood approach happening in Denver. Like I live in a neighborhood that allows accessory dwelling units as of right now. But would the state law supersede Denver's neighborhood by neighborhood approach? Not at all. Um, it, it, uh, it it allows accessory dwelling units and it allows local governments to to have accessory or actually kind of mandates them to be able to do it. Denver's already doing it. They're already ahead of the curve on this. Um, so and this this doesn't ask Denver to do anything that they aren't already doing. I mean, we'll be continuing to watch this because we've been watching the evictions stuff and um, the, all the issues with landlords. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, I I'm also just wondering, since you look at this bigger picture, you're looking at this all year long, was there a surprise for you this session? Was there a bill or something that you were surprised by that passed or didn't or just evoked conversation? Something that you were surprised by? Um, I, I, I shouldn't have been surprised by it, um, but the, the whole conversation around condos. Uh, condos are the entry and the exit point if you're if you're a family looking for your first home, if you're a senior looking to downsize, condos have traditionally been the path to do that. But because of Colorado's condo construction defects laws, developers have basically told said to to Colorado, we're not doing this anymore. And so the number of available new condos has just dramatically plummeted. Now the developers will tell you it's because of liability insurance. It, uh, which is disputed. related to this co- this construction defect exactly. Laws it's from it's the cost of cover. Ago. It's the cost of covering lawsuits, and they they claim that it's this this liability insurance, which is three times the cost that it should be, is what's keeping them from building these units. Now, if you get if you talk to the homeowners, especially the ones who are uh, uh, suing over construction defects, they'll tell you this is a problem nationwide. Uh, that condo construction is down everywhere, and they they dispute this this liability insurance thing. We had three bills on construction defects in the legislature this year, and it, and all three of them died in the last week of the session. Um, you had one that would have made it a little harder for for people to sue over construction defects, though the sponsors were adamant that they were not trying to keep people from suing. They just wanted a little bit more reasonable uh, guardrails around it. On the other side, you had the folks who uh, affiliated with the trial lawyers who wanted to make it easier to sue, and they would have extended the statute of limitations and something else known as the statute of repose, which just says how long you have to file a lawsuit once you've discovered that you've got a defect. Um, both of those bills died. The third bill was to study the liability insurance issue to see, if, is that actually true? That died too. Interesting. What do you make of that? I mean, I don't want to say like, what do you think about it? But you're you're watching these things play out. What was it? What was that play there that we weren't seeing, you know, as civilians not in the, the watching the debate go down? Some of it was just they ran out of time to actually deal with this. Um, I think that's probably true for those two major construction defects bills. And this was an issue upon which there was no compromise. Um, and, and you saw a lot of other very, very big issues that got some really good compromise conversations. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, but the, this, this was an issue that where the two sides were so far apart that there just was no, no, no way for them to, to reach any kind of compromise. And, and everybody said, okay, this is, this isn't working. We'll, we'll call, we'll go back next year. I'm thinking about, you know, as Denverites, we, we see headlines at this time of year, all of the end of the session, there's a hundred bills or something going through. But when it comes to like new laws that might actually impact our day to day in Denver, is there anything that struck, struck you or stuck out to you? You know, a, a lot of air quality bills, um, some which succeeded, some which did not. Um, you had this this compromise between the governor and uh, the oil and gas industry and the environmental um, community, uh, which was announced in the last week of the session where 
the they all everybody agreed to pull their ballot measures in exchange for uh, higher fees on oil and gas to pay for transit. Huh. Uh, so, hmm. you know, that that's that's important funny because they're they're the governor is lo- and and Democratic lawmakers are looking for every penny in the couch cushions they can to fund rapid transit passenger rail. Uh, a a mountain uh, rail that will go all the way out to Craig and and Hayden and, and on the Western Slope, uh, and building the end line. You know, there's they're they're looking for transit money everywhere they possibly can. So this this is kind of a big one, especially if you're going uh, if you want to take light rail from say Denver all the way to. Uh, Longmont. That's been a promise that's been made to voters by RTD for years, and they just have never been able to finish it, but, um, fu- citing funding issues. This is going to put a lot of money into all those transit those transit things. But really, I think the biggest thing that people will notice, uh, and it may take a couple of years, is the affordable housing issue. I, that's the one thing I, everybody should be watching for. To more and, and the governor's position is more stock means that that stock will be affordable. And there are, there are mandates about making some of the, in the transit-oriented communities bill, for example, there are mandates about making sure that that's affordable housing. So keep your, you know, keep your eyes out for that. Hopefully we're going to start seeing some, some new housing and stuff that people can actually afford to live on without having to make $150,000 a year. Yeah. And it's really interesting just thinking about all of the things that you've talked about in the last 30 minutes is like, all kind of go back to the housing issue, affordability, zoning, uh, water issues, where we can build density issues, transit issues. So it is all kind of like, I think we'll be just watching these pieces fall into place and see what that does for us on the housing front. There's always issues left unsettled at the end of the session. And um, there's things that lawmakers just cannot agree on or, or want to bring back to the drawing board. What do you think are one or two issues that we might keep hearing about next year? RTD. <laughs> We're RTD. back in okay. transit again. Uh, we had this Great. big, the, one of the things that died at the end of the session was this big RTD reform bill. And it started out, and, and this is this was something that was of great concern to uh, people of color in Denver. They wanted, the, the sponsors wanted to really shake up the RTD board. And that raised some very big concerns about whether or not people of color would actually be on the board. Um, it, it's a nine member board right now. There are two uh, representatives from the black and brown community on that board. Uh, and there was a big concern that, that, that they were going to be shut out under this proposal. Uh, it, it caused so much uh, controversy and so much screaming at the Capitol that they dropped that part of it. But they still had some pretty big reform plans uh, for RTD, a, a ten-year transit plan, and you know a bunch of other things, and they just they just couldn't get that one across the finish line. So that 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 died in the last couple of days. I will I want to say one thing that I saw this year that I have never seen in the the very long time that I've been at the state capitol, and that was the number of bills that died. Uh, in the three days before the session started. When when the legislature began its work on Monday, there were 238 bills that still needed to be passed. That's a third of all the bills that were introduced in the session. We had 705, and this was actually was a little bit more than a third. And, and it was just astonishing. It's like, how do they get through that much in just three days? Well, the answer was, you let a lot of things die on the calendar, and that's exactly what happened, is that you had a lot of bills. Uh, it was about 50 bills that died on Monday and another 10 or so that died on Tuesday. So that eliminated the backlog. So when, when the session started on Wednesday, it was it was a very manageable 66. <laughs> so were um, lawmakers just behind, or were they? was this a tactic? What do you, why, why did that happen? A couple of things at play. Number one, you just, you had 90 more bills introduced in this session than you had the year before. That's just more work. Uh, number two, this is a very tight budget year. And I, I, I suspect that this is the really big reason that those bills died. They, 50 of those bills died in appropriations committees. And lawmakers were warned at the beginning of the session that this was going to be a tight budget year. There wasn't going to be a whole lot of money for new programs. Well, Mm, you know, uh, people ran bills anyway. I mean, there was one, uh, one bill that had a billion dollar 
cost on it. And it was like, where, you know, this is, this, it's, it would have been nice if they could have done something like that. This was actually setting up a children's behavioral health system, statewide system. And it was a bill that had bipartisan support and it died. Uh, and, and, and you have to think it's because of the price tag. They just didn't have the money. And I think that that was true for most of those bills. Uh, they, they died for, for lack of funds. Um, and, and, so I think that that's that's probably that was probably the bigger factor in what I called the Monday massacre. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad we have you to decipher all of this because I again I see these headlines and it's like 200 bills, you know, and, and you're giving us such great context into how many bills they have to look at every session, which is yeah. really wild. And this um, wasn't and this wasn't a record. The 705 bills that they introduced this year was fell. A, Short. the The record was actually set about twenty years ago, and it's about seven. I think it was seven twenty seven, and everybody kept saying, "Oh, it's a record this year." It's like not even close. <laughs> well, Marianne, this has been so helpful. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, Bree, it's been a pleasure. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed this show, why not take a minute to tell Senate President Steve Fenberg about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. This is so, I don't know how you keep track of all this stuff. It's like kind of mind blowing. You, you just, you gotta be just a real political junkie.